Thank you. So, is there a limit to the power of data? As we've heard and as we hear uh, every, actually a lot these days, it seems like data analytics will rule the world in the future, right? Basically starting from zero in less than 25 years, we've digitized 99% of the entire global information stockpile. Back in the late 80s, each one of us um, technologically exchanged the informational equivalent of about two newspaper pages per day. Uh, that is now up to 25 to 50 entire newspapers that each one of us exchanges, uh, the equivalent of that, each day. If, if, we, if we, as the result of that, the world can store about almost two setabytes. If you would store this in CD-ROM, disks, we could build about eight stacks of disks that reach from here to the moon. <laughs> What's even more impressive is that the world's computational capacity has even grown two or three times faster than the world's information and communication capacity. So if all the 2.5 million students of the United Kingdom would calculate from the Big Bang until now, 24-7 without a break, they could possibly if there would all be little math geniuses, only calculate, execute half as many calculations as the world's computers can execute in only one second. So the idea behind this big data phenomena of today is to use this incredible computational power to look for patterns in this amazing information overload to inform decisions, right? So to convert data and information about us into knowledge about us. And that's powerful. Now, however, my message here today is that data analytics alone will not dominate the world in the future. So why is that? Is it because of some technical reasons? You know, many people say um, their data analytics is grappling with some of these technical issues. For example, it has problems with the correlation versus causation issues that, that you might have heard. So, so let's look at that. Um, this graph here, for example, seems to suggest that in order to increase the number of civil engineering doctorates, all we have to do is to consume more cheese, right? <laughs> yeah. What are these vegans thinking? No, seriously, right? Um, <laughs> This graph here seems to suggest that it shows that the numbers of movies that the American actor Nicolas Cage participated in is persistently accompanied by the number of people killed being hit by sports equipment. <laughs> so, somebody in Hollywood, tell the man to stop. You know? That's not an issue of movie taste, that's a national health issue. You know? um, this here shows an impressive correlation of the number of mobile phones in the United Kingdom, and the number of deaths by people falling or tripping. You know? So next time you walk around in London, you might want to pay attention a little bit. So um, gets you thinking, right? So is there or is there not? Uh, you know? and, and this even stronger correlation here uh, shows a correlation between children's shoe size and their internet usage, which of course suggests that all we have to do to increase digital literacy is to somehow make our children's feet grow. <laughs> so now as you can imagine from these examples, uh, there must be, and there certainly are, techniques and methodologies to help us to parse out correlation from causation. It's, it's not always easy, and it's sometimes extremely tricky. tricky. Um, but having more and better data certainly helps helps us to understand that it's probably age and reading skills and not shoe size that increases literacy, right? So and more and better data is what big data is actually all about. Actually, before we had this fine-grained digital footprint about humankind, doing social science was more like trying to do astronomy without a telescope or trying to do uh, biology and genomics without a microscope, you know, we just, we just couldn't see. So big data now for the first time gives us the unique opportunity to convert social studies into real social science. Uh, and that helps us to avoid these kind of pitfalls better than ever before. So these kind of technical issues certainly won't, won't prevent data analytics from ruling the world. The ultimate limit to the power of data leads us deep down the rabbit hole to the very philosophy of science. 
The gist of the argument is that all kinds of data, big or not, is from the past. Or, in the best case, the real-time uh, past, because as soon as you record it, it's already past, right? Uh, so data can only tell you what has already happened. Now, if the past and the future follow the same logic, the past can tell you a lot about the future. However, if significant changes occur, predictions based on past data, which was different, can be extremely deceiving. So this is known as Lucas' critique in economics or uh, Goodhart's law in finance or Campbell's law in education. Think about it this way. It is true that Facebook and Amazon and Google can predict your behavior better than any psychologist if your future behavior and your past behavior follow the same logic. If you fall in love or get divorced, if you change your job or if you change the country, future predictions based on your past data can be deceiving. The best we could do is we can take the data from somebody else who fell in love and project that onto you, assuming that that's how you would also act if you fall in love. But you're quite unique and that already requires assumptions. And assumptions that, that leads already beyond mere data analytics, that requires theory. Because theory allows us to think about how you would act in theory if you would fall in love. So if changes occur, uh, data analytics is by itself is not enough and it requires a theory. So, and actually, most of public and private sector activities work very hard on changing the future, in the best case, to create a better world. So before becoming a professor at the University of California, I was working at the United Nations Secretariat for 15 years. And it's the explicit goal of the organization to create a future that is different from the war-torn uh, world of poverty of past century. You know, a developed Africa will not simply be a statistically extrapolated version of Europeans' development trajectory. You know, this assumption that two different uh, that the conditions of two different cases are exactly the same, what we call ceteris paribus in science, and I was always in the footprint, that, is, that usually never happens. Um, the, the benefit of theory is that it has these knobs and dials which allows us to change and even add new knobs and dials, parameters, you know, that allows us to think about, okay, what a developed Africa would be like in theory. Now, the good news is that the digital revolution does not only uh, revolutionize data science, it also revolutionizes theory-driven modeling. Engineers, for example, have used computers for a long time to simulate skyscrapers and bridges, and bridges that never existed in reality. In the social science, you can imagine that a little bit like playing SimCity. You remember SimCity? It's a city building video game that's been around for a quarter of a century. Uh, this up here is what it looked like when I played it as a kid, and now it's in its sixth generation. <laughs> yeah, right, not fair, right? But, uh, <laughs> anyways, um, so recently they came up with a version called SimCity EDU that teaches high school students basic intuition about complex social systems. And uh, this is what it looks like. So here we have our city with a typical pollution problem. Now in science, in contrary to this video game, our model usually has to represent reality. So if this would be a real scientific agent-based computer simulation, we would use big data and then calibrate our model, big data about pollution, for example, calibrate for real pollution levels or employment levels here of a real city or energy production levels. Uh, as they occur in reality. So here we have a coal power plant, obviously a big polluter. Now we use the theory of sustainable development and simply bulldoze this coal power plant, right? And while we added this one here as well, so we change the course of history now and we build a brand new um, wind power plant, for example, right here. And uh, see what happens. Um, 
Well, it tells us that the power in our city is dangerously low now. Okay, so let's just add a brand new solar power plant right next to it. Now, this is a reality that never existed. And this new reality will create a myriad of unexpected, non-linear, emergent phenomena that ripples through this social ecosystem, top down and bottom up at the macro level, from the, the, the meso level to the micro level, right? So now we can study all of these things that never happened. For example, here in front of City Hall, we see that some, some citizens now start to protest. <laughs> Maybe because of high energy prices, you know, and then changing energy patterns might affect employment, which might affect traffic patterns. Now, these kind of emergent phenomena are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to predict with statistical extrapolation based on a past that was simply different, you know. So the good news is that in the digital age, uh, the simulation of futures that have never been become as intuitive as uh, playing a video game, right? <laughs> and as fun, actually. And that's a powerful tool for theory building. A theory being a family of models, such as these models here, right? This model here. Now, big data without any theory actually can be incredibly dangerous because it can actually lock you into your own path. So for example, when a company understands your preference structure, they will only send you uh, products and services that, that you like based on what you liked in the past, right? Big data, personalized marketing. Don't we all love it? The same applies for uh, political parties. Once they understand that you are pro-abortion or that you like green energy or that you have a slight affinity for guns, the powers out there will zoom into you because they're like, well, that's somebody you can vote for our, for our purposes, right? They will start sending you messages and soon after a while you will think like, wow, the entire world, it consists of gun fanatics, right? And you strengthen your own beliefs and might even become one yourself. So the basic argument is here, um, Reinforcing past patterns, and that's what data does, big data does best, uh, can, strengthens them, obviously, and can even create extremism. Now, it's worse. Even if you would like to change your old patterns, big data can make that more difficult. For example, you might have heard the announcement, uh, this call might be recorded or monitored for quality assurance purposes, right? <laughs> you usually think that the head of human resources is listening in, trying to make sure that you're treated well, right? <laughs> now, that's, that's usually not what happens. <laughs> um, it's often 10 million algorithms that listen to you while you talk, actually analyzing and classifying your personality while you talk, pigeonholing your personality into rubrics like uh, opinions driven or reactions driven or emotions driven, right? And this is then used, the algorithms then tell the, tell the call center of how to best deal with you. And now it affects the kind of people you are matched with, the kind of conversations you are drawn into, and the kind of conflict resolution that you, you are getting. And that's a good thing. Being matched with like-minded reduces call duration by half and doubles customer satisfaction. Fantastic. What big data can do, right? But what now if these call center calls somehow achieve to bring out the irritated, grumpy, dumpy within yourself, right? Well, you actually work very hard right now to change this annoying behavior of yours. So, so while you try constantly to work very hard to bring out the hidden Dalai Lama from within yourself, right? <laughs> In a big data world, the entire digital universe will work very hard to reinforce your old patterns. So, because what does big data know about who you would like to be? How could it? It only knows the old grumpy dumpy that you've always been. So, so in a big data world, your free will to change, it's somehow locked into your past behavior. So, Actually, with every digital step you take and with every digital word you utter, you consolidate that, right? Um, so big data creates this impressive, or should I say oppressive, digital stereotype about who you supposedly are and ever will be. Uh, and what societies supposedly are and how they work based on how things used to be. And this creates self-fulfilling path dependencies. 
Now, in order to create real change, changes in paradigms, in order to create real innovation, we need something qualitatively different from data from the past. We need visions. Visions are these theories that model futures that have never been. Visions are extremely creative, theoretical acts. Data alone cannot tell us what you would be like if from now on the Dalai Lama from within you will constantly win over the old grumpy dumpy from within you. <laughs> Data alone cannot tell us what it would be like to live in a world without pollution, without hunger, without war. How could it? However, in theory, these things do exist. So, is there a limit to the power of data? Clearly, yes. Oh, yes. We will surely need data to calibrate our models, to inform our visions, to ground our visions into reality. But data is from the past, and our past shall not define our future. Our visions define our future. And visions, paradigm-changing theories, and out-of-the-data-box thinking is what is needed more than ever to keep the course toward a different, a better future, especially in a big data world. Thank you. <laughs>